It's a great pleasure to have Dr. Matthew Dodelson uh, from Bali IPMU uh, in my 43rd uh, QSTM seminar. And uh, Matthew is a very young guy. He's working in uh, mostly in quantum field theories, string theories, and quantum gravity stuffs. He did his PhD from Stanford Institute for Theoretical Physics, University of Stanford with Professor Eva Silverstein. And uh, right now he's a postdoc with Professor Hiroshi Oguri at Valley IPMU. And uh, today he is going to talk about singularities of thermal correlators at strong coupling. And uh, thank you, Matthew, for agreeing to give this talk in my 43rd QSTN seminar series. And we all are welcoming you from Potsdam. Yeah, you can start. Okay, well, thanks a lot for having me and for the invitation. Um, it's an honor to be the 43rd um, speaker here. And uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll be talking about um, singularities of, of thermal correlation functions and of strong coupling. Uh, and this is based on work in progress with Hiroshi Uguri. Um, and at any time, if you, if you have questions, please feel free to interrupt me um, if you need me to clarify something. So here's a brief outline of, of the talk. Um, I'll start with the motivation um, from vacuum ADS-CFD, um, ADS-CFD ADS in the vacuum, and, and talk about singularities in correlation functions in holography. Uh, this is called the bulk point singularity. Uh, then I'll, I'll move on to the case of interest, uh, which is uh, thermal correlation functions. And I'll talk about singularities in the two-point function, uh, light cone singularities in the ADS black hole. Um, and in sections three through five, I'll uh, talk about how these singularities are actually resolved in string theory. Uh, so that's the main result of my talk. And finally, I'll talk about some uh, more general black holes very briefly, and I'll, I'll, con I'll conclude with a summary. So let's start with the motivation. So a kind of a fundamental question in conformal field theory is what kinds of singularities can arise in correlation functions? Um, here, I'll, I'll mostly, I'll only be interested in, in uh, position space correlation functions. So this is a, uh, this is an, an interesting question because um, uh, the structure of correlation, of correlation functions or scattering matrix amplitudes in, in quantum field theory, um, uh, tell us something about the theory. Uh, uh, simple poles in the scattering matrix uh, tell us about physical states in the theory, and we want to address similar questions in conformal field. So what kinds of singularities are allowed? Um, well, in Euclidean signature, not much. All we have is the OPE singularity. And um, uh, the OPE singularity happens when two operators approach each other. Um, and in particular, they approach the same point. And all that happens is that the, uh, the correlation function uh, diverges like a power law uh, uh, near that point, and the power is given by the, scal uh, the scaling dimension of the, of the operator. So that's not too interesting. It, it only knows about the, uh, the scaling dimension of the operator. Now, in uh, Lorentzian signature, things get a bit more interesting uh, because we can have singularities. Matthew? Maybe yes. a real question I'm asking. So why this power two is appearing? Delta I can understand, but why two? This why this mod thing appearing? Is it kind of a distance between these two operators? Yes. Yeah, so that's that's the uh, that's simply the distance between the two operators. Exactly. So, uh, so this is uh, determined by scale invariance. Uh -oh. Uh, does that answer the question? Yes, yes, we can proceed. Okay, great. So in uh, Lorentzian signature, 
things get more interesting because we can have singularities at non-coincident points uh, when two points are not equal. So the obvious example is if we have two points that are light cone separated, they're light like separated. Um, in this case, we get a singularity, which is the ordinary uh, light cone singularity. Um, a, a more interesting example is, is called a Landau singularity. And this happens when we can draw a Feynman diagram uh, that only has light-like lines in, in position space. So we have some vertices and we have some lines and all the lines are light-like. In this case, there's a, a perturbative singularity in, in collation functions. Uh, now, perturbatively, this is all of them. This exhausts the list of singularities. Uh, but of course, there could be more non-perturbatively. Um, Incidentally, it was proven. Uh, um, Matthew, yes, yes. Part ambition in what? Uh, could you see, uh, say one more time? You say that part arbitrarily. So part arbitration in oh. what parameter? Right. So we. So if we have a theory that has a, a small coupling constant uh, that is almost free, uh, okay. then it would be, it would be perturb, uh, perturbation theory in, in that in that parameter. Okay. For instance, in 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 five four theory, it would be the. Okay. A, a five okay. So you were here mentioning about in general, kind of. Yeah. So I was about to say that in um, in general there could be more singularities. Uh, incidentally, in um, in one plus one dimensions, it, it's been proven that um, in fact there are no other singularities. But in higher dimensions, that has not been proven. Okay. Okay. And you were uh, interested in higher dimensions, particularly. Um, so I'm interested in higher dimensions and also the, the, uh, the uh, thermal case, but I'll get to that in, okay. in a second. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, great. So um, in this vacuum case, um, we can look for new singularities in the whole graphic regime. So this was first done by uh, Gary uh, Giddings and, and Penadonis in, in 09. And in the holographic regime, uh, we can have Lando diagrams in, in the bulk. And so I, I drew a picture here at the bottom. So here we have four operators on the boundary and uh, they're connected via a uh, light rays uh, to an interaction point in the bulk P. And so that's a bulk Lando diagram and we call this a bulk point singularity. And um, in this configuration, the correlation function is actually singular. Um, so I, 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 I include the formula here, so z and z bar are the, are the cross ratios, and um, we get a power law, in, in this case, as z, as z goes to z bar. Um, so, uh, Matthew, yes. one more, like, uh, since I'm not aware of this diagram, so I'm mostly fam familiar with the Witten diagram, okay, uh -huh. in the bulk. So is there any connection with this diagram with the Witten diagram? Yeah, so this is a Witten diagram. Um, this is a simple Witten contact diagram, uh, but it's just, it's just in a certain kinematic uh, configuration where there's a singularity. Okay, okay. Great, right. So in this case, we have a, a Landau diagram in the bulk. Um, however, if you look at the boundary kinematics, there's no uh, a Landau diagram on the boundary. Uh, so this is a singularity that does not show up in perturbation theory. It seems like a really new singularity. So is it? Um, it's actually not. Um, and, and the reason is because uh, 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 when, uh, uh, by deriving this uh, singularity, we assumed uh, a local field theory in the bulk. And in, in particular, we took the Patuft coupling and, and uh, N to, uh, to infinity. Um, strictly. Um, uh, uh, so we should really keep uh, lambda finite first and then sum up all the stringy corrections. And in fact, what happens, as uh, and, and Simmons Duffin, is that this bulk point singularity is resolved by stringy corrections. So the interpretation is that this, uh, the singularity is smoothed out uh, by the gross Mendy expansion of the string world shape. The string expands. And there's no longer a, a, a sharp uh, point P in, in the bulk. And so the singularity is resolved. 
Now, uh, uh, last year, so, uh, just one uh, uh, thing, like you have mentioned about large N. So do you have any idea what happened in uh, finite N? Yeah, so at finite N, uh, for uh, uh, weakly coupled string theory, uh, so that means the string scale is, um, the string length is, is much larger than the Planck long, uh, uh, length, but then uh, the answer is uh, cut off by strings and N uh, actually plays no role here. Um, if there's no hierarchy between the string length and the Planck length, uh, then uh, presumably N could play a role, but it's not known. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, last year, Uguri and I uh, uh, generalized this uh, result a bit, and we showed that, um, in fact, um, the bulk point singularity in higher dimensions um, is resolved in all cases except when there's a boundary uh, uh, Landa diagram. And so this uh, classifies the singularities of uh, uh, correlation function in holographic theory. And it says that only boundary uh, lambda diagrams are allowed. Now we can try to extend this result a bit uh, to non-vacuum states. So for example, uh, we can take a thermal ensemble on, on the boundary. So um, uh, fortunately for a thermal ensemble, um, at finite temperature, uh, conformal invariance is broken. And so we can just uh, study the two point uh, function. Uh, Matthew, sorry. Uh, yes. Thermal uh, ensemble means canonical? Um, 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 the, the thing that's dual to a black hole in the bulk. <laughs> uh, I, I always forget the difference. <laughs> sorry. OK. <laughs> I'm just asking for, so don't mind. I'm asking too many questions. <laughs> sure, no problem. Yeah. So. We, um, yes, so we, uh, we're at finite temperature. Um, in particular, uh, uh, whichever one computes uh, trace e to the minus uh, beta h times the operators. Yeah, yeah, so this is basically called canonical. Okay, okay, so yeah. it's, it's and what do you mean by non vacuum states? Oh, I just mean that I mean, a vacuum state is a state, is, is a zero energy state, so okay, um, yeah. so some thermal state you are. Mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Oh, a yeah, yeah. So, uh, so this would be the, uh, the simplest example of a non vacuum state. Yes, yeah. Right. So um, at finite temperature, we can study the two point function and, it, and it's non trivial. Um, so instead of uh, studying high, higher correlation functions, uh, uh, we can start with the, uh, the ordinary two point function. So it, it's a function of t and phi, where phi is the, uh, uh, the angular variable and t is the, is the uh, time variable. And it's at finite temperature beta. And we want to know what kind of singularities are, are in it. Now, um, uh, we can take a couple limits. So at infinite volume, we can just conformally map to the plane. And so we know all the singularities. It's just that t equals plus or minus phi, the, uh, the ordinary light cone singularities. So that's not that interesting. Um, so uh, just one point. What kind yeah. of correlator it is? Is it kind of, uh, it is not an equal time correlator. It's like different times. Okay. Yeah. So, yes. uh, like, is there any connection with, maybe like, you may think it is weird, but like, uh, is there any connection with quantum chaos or something like that? So uh, the OTOC, uh, it mainly probes uh, near horizon effects. Yeah. And yeah. we won't get anywhere near the horizon. Um, uh, so okay. I, would say, I would say no. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. So we're interested in, in this simple two-point function. And another simple case is in free field theory. You, uh, uh, you can just compute this function, and again, you find uh, the ordinary light cone. So in the rest of this talk, I'll discuss a more interesting limit, which is the holographic limit. And uh, just like the bulk point singularity, uh, uh, we want to see if there's any new singularities for this correlation function. And if so, are they resolved at finite uh, uh, lambda? So that's where we're going. Are there any uh, questions um, on this 
on this first uh, motivational part. Guys, please ask questions if you have. Okay, uh, so I'll move on. Um, so now I want to describe the light cone of an ADS black hole, um, where are the light cone singularities. Okay, so um, if we're interested in the boundary two point function, we should look for configurations where the boundary points are separated by a null geodesic because those lead to singularities in the boundary two point function. So we should study null geodesics in the ADS black hole. And I, and I wrote down the metric here. Um, so it's dependent on the dimension. We have uh, time coordinates, radio co uh, coordinates, and uh, d minus one angular coordinates. So for null geodesics, if we take them to be on the, on the equatorial plane, uh, there are two conserved quantities, uh, namely the energy and the angular momentum, E and L. And um, uh, the space of all uh, null geode uh, geodesics is, is parameterized by, uh, by a single parameter, which is E over L, uh, the ratio. And um, if we look at the radial motion, that's determined by this equation, which is uh, one half r dot squared equals uh, one half e squared minus v. And this is uh, this is a particle mo uh, moving in a in a one dimensional potential. And uh, Matthew, what is L parameter? L is the angular momentum. Ah. The yes. So this is the um, uh, the potential. Um, and I plotted it here for d equals um, d equals four, which is uh, the main case of uh, uh, that I'll I'll deal with here. Um, uh, but uh, what we see for d equals four is that there's a maximum of this potential. Uh, so that's called the photon sphere. It's uh, the closest you can uh, you can come to the black hole if you're on a if you're on a null geodesic and still escape. So um, uh, for any d greater than two, there's a maximum to this potential, and, there, and therefore there's a photon sphere. And so what this means is that uh, geodesics uh, can come in from r uh, from r equals infinity and then escape uh, back out to r equals infinity, and this leads to singularities in the two-point function. So this was first uh, discussed by Hubeni, Liu, and uh, Rangamani in 06. So uh, let's draw some of these geodesics. So what kinds of geodesics are allowed? Well, first, they're geodesics that stay at the boundary. Uh, so they're just uh, a light rays at the boundary um, uh, cylinder. Uh, so they connect x1 and x2, and they stay on the boundary. Uh, second, uh, they're geodesics that are far away from the black hole. Uh, uh, so these do, uh, don't see the black hole uh, mass because they're far away, and so they're approximately ADS geodesics. Uh, so in this picture, uh, they stay out, out, on, out at large R here. Um, and um, uh, null geodesics in ADS have uh, uh, delta uh, delta phi and delta and delta t equal to uh, pi. Um, it takes uh, pi time to, uh, to get from one side of ADS to, uh, to the other on, an, on a null geode uh, geodesic. And so these geodesics have approximately delta phi equals pi. Uh, so that's the second kind. And finally, sorry, and finally, there are geode uh, geodesics that come in and they spend a lot of time uh, near the maximum, uh, near the photon sphere. So, they come in from infinity and they spend a lot of time right there at the maximum. Um, and that looks like this. Um, so so um, the green line here is the photon sphere. Um, the photon comes in, it, it wraps the photon sphere in the time, it, it escapes out uh, to infinity. Are these pictures clear? Is it clear what geodesics do in ADS? Yeah, perfect. Great. Okay, great. So 
uh, uh, we can be a little more quantitative now. So we can compute the location of these singularities by integrating the uh, geodesic equations. And um, these uh, take simple differential form as, you, as usual in black holes. And um, I wrote it like this. So here, our plus and our minus are the zeros of R dot. So R dot has, um, has four zeros, but the, uh, two of them are positive, and uh, that's R plus and R minus. And so in particular, R plus is the turning point of a geodesic. A geodesic uh, comes in from infinity. Four zeros for D equal to two, oh, wait, 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 but D equal to four. Yes, 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 yes. right. Yes. Uh, so R plus is, is the turning point for the, uh, the geodesic. And um, uh, now we just need to integrate these equations, and that's simple. And we get some elliptic functions. This is elliptic k, um, and it's and it's a it's a simple elliptic function. Now um, we can draw the singularities. Uh, sorry. So the first the first singularity we draw is this, are these two uh, red lines. And what that corresponds to was uh, the first picture up here. It's a, it's a geodesic that just uh, stays at the boundary the whole time. And then we have this first blue branch. Uh, so that first blue branch is a, geode is a geodesic that uh, uh, comes in from a, uh, from Matthew, sorry for the interruption. Okay. There is a question in the chat box I want to go into on with because the guy couldn't able to uh, communicate. Internet connection is not that stable. So okay. uh, this guy is asking, uh, what is the meaning of boundary points are now separated? Means I mean to say there is no time and space variable or collectively single variable. Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, yeah, so can you please look into the chat box? Yeah, uh, let's see if I can see it. Um, I might need to stop my screen share. Um, hmm. Um, okay, the chat. Okay. What is the meaning of boundary points are null separated? Um, no time and space variables are collectively. So the meaning of uh, boundary points being null separated is that there's a null geodesic in the bulk uh, that connects them. Uh, uh, so let me know if, if that answered your question. Is that okay? The answer is okay for you? Please say yes or no so that we can proceed. Yeah, so you can great. Go. Okay, great. So, um, uh, so I was explaining this picture. Uh, so this, uh, sorry, uh, uh, this picture here is a picture of the boundary, and and, and we have uh, the angular variable phi and the and the time variable of t. And I was explaining this first branch, which is a blue line. Uh, uh, so that's uh, parameterized by e over l. It's uh, um, it's the space of all new of all uh, null geodesics that come in from infinity and escape uh, back out to infinity. And uh, uh, so that's a new line of, of singularities, this first blue line in the, in the theory. Um, we also have higher branches of this uh, blue line. So that happens because a geodesic uh, can come in from, uh, from infinity and hit infinity and, and bounce back into the bulk. And so that leads to these higher branches of the singularities and uh, why these, these uh, blue lines are parallel to each other? So they're, they're actually not quite parallel. So uh, you see that at late times, they're parallel to each other. Um, but at, at blue red line, uh, they're actually not straight. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, if you just enlarge it, then I can able to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it, it's curved a little bit there. Yeah, yeah, I can understand. Right. Okay. Okay, good. 
So let's try to understand this picture better. So let's take some limits. Um, in, the, in the early time uh, limit, um, the turning point approaches infinity, which means we're very far, uh, very far away from the black hole. Uh, then we have delta t is delta of phi is about pi um, because we're essentially in ADS. And so that, uh, that corresponds uh, to this piece when uh, delta t and, and delta phi are, are about pi. In the late time limit, as uh, you noted, uh, the geodesic approaches a straight line. And the reason for that is that it wraps around the photon sphere many times. Um, and therefore, its velocity is approximately equal to the velocity of the photon sphere. Um, and the velocity of the photon sphere is given, is given by this quantity, and it's square root 1 plus uh, 1 over 4n. And so you see that uh, that's why we have a straight line at late times. Um, it, it's also interesting that uh, these branches actually intersect in a, in a very complicated way. Um, uh, so here, uh, uh, phi uh, was identified with phi plus 2 pi. And, and we can draw the same picture, and we see that there's a lot of intersection. And so this is a very complicated uh, correlation function. And uh, there, in particular, there are many caustics where sing uh, singularities uh, uh, can, uh, can intersect. So uh, that's the general structure of this, of this correlation function. Uh, uh, now we can study um, what happens to the correlation function as we approach the singularity. Uh, so all, all I've done so far is to, is to study the kinematics, and now let's study the uh, dynamics or what the correlation function actually, how it behaves. So when the two points are almost null, se uh, are almost null separated, uh, they can be connected by a slightly spaced like geodesic. And in the geodesic approximation, if the correlation function is uh, just equal to e to the minus uh, mass of the particle uh, times uh, the renormalized length, uh, 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 where the renormalized length is, is the length minus uh, the log of the cutoff. And so this, uh, this comes from the basic ADS-CFT uh, dictionary, and, and we can compute it. So um, I use the, uh, the radial geodesic equation to compute this quantity and it's equal to minus log e squared minus l squared. And so we can plug that in uh, up here uh, to get the, uh, the behavior of the correlation function. Uh, the final step, because we don't really want to know the oh, correlation Matthew, this yes. I wanted to ask one thing. So I know that this formula uh, is uh, commonly used in ADS, this two point thing. I'm just a, a little bit, uh, want to understand. Like, yeah. you know that there is something called DSCFT dictionary. Yeah. So, uh, yes. DSCFT. Yes. Yeah. So, here, just by taking uh, the time, if you Euclidean, take the Euclidean rotation, like weak rotate or something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you able to get the some kind of DC correlation functions out of that? Um. I have to think about that. Um, uh, I thought you wick rotate the other variable. I, I thought you uh, you wick uh, rotate um, z or something. Uh, the radio. Yeah, variable. z maybe. Yeah, take z. Uh, so, but z is d yeah. I, I don't remember exactly how that works, unfortunately. Um, okay. 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 No problem. Just I'm just asking. Maybe I can I can comment on that. Um, sure. Can you so, yeah. So so hi. So um. So this this formula. Uh, so like the two point function being exponential minus uh, geodesic length, you yeah. can derive it uh, basically from a, a path integral representation of the two point function. Yeah. So. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, exponential minus m s, where s is the length of a particle, and then you, well, the geodesic length of a particle, and then you integrate over all possible paths that connect uh, the two insertion points. 
Mm -hmm. So if you do a saddle point approximation to that uh, integral, uh, then the, the, lo the longest geodesic will, will dominate. And this, will, I mean, the longest, well, the longest path will dominate, and that's the geodesic. So that's how you get uh, this kind of, uh, of formula. Okay. So, so this, this can work, I mean, this, this works not only in ADS-CFT, but anytime you want to compute a two-point function, uh, like of scalar fields it propagating in some background, then, then that, that always works. Yeah. No, I, I can understand what you are saying. I just uh, wanted to ask because like some people usually calculate the things in the ADS side and then go to the DS correlators using this kind of uh, like uh, analytic continuation or some kind of weak rotation doing something that. So people usually go to from ADS side to DS side. So I just wanted to ask that whether this will give you the similar kind of result or not. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that you can. I mean, you will recover something like that. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I mean, I mean, let me just uh, comment briefly. So in uh, the sitter space in uh, DSCFT. There's no, there's not going to be any uh, light cone singularity because it's a Euclidean CFT. Um, I, unless I'm uh, sorely mistaken, there's no light ray that connects uh, two boundary points. So I, I would say that uh, this is um, a specific to ADS. Okay. Yeah. So, so can I can okay, I good. ask a, a question? Another, another question? Sure. Um, so, so here you're you're using this geodesic approximation to compute a two point function in a thermal state. Mm -hmm. But for example, in, in three dimensions, we, we know the exact form of the of the two-point function. Right? Uh, you mean in three in three bulk dimensions? Yeah, three bulk dimensions. Yeah, yeah so three bulk dimensions is special. And I, I should have said before, I, I'm ruling it out because uh, there's no photon sphere in, in three dimensions. And in fact, uh, the, uh, the BTZ uh, potential, it, all all light rays are are sucked into the black hole, and, and so there are no new singularities in, in, in BTZ. Um, okay. Yeah, so I, I should say we're in more than in more than three dimensions. Okay. Okay. And can can you say why there is no photon sphere in three yeah, D? So, yeah. Yeah. It's very easy. Yes. Um, so if we look at this potential, um, and we said equals uh, two, um, uh, then we see that it's just a constant plus one over R squared. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, there's no, uh, there's no minimum. Okay. Okay. Thank you. There's no, sure. Great. Okay. So I just derived the renormalized length. I, I plugged it in here. Um, and finally, we probably want ENL in terms of uh, delta T and delta phi because those are the boundary variables, uh, uh, T and phi. And you can uh, just integrate the, uh, the geodesic equations and you, and you find this answer. And um, in particular, at late times, which means that the, uh, the geodesic wraps the photon sphere many times, uh, uh, we get a very simple parallel singularity. Um, the correlation function is equal to, is, is approximately equal to uh, v, uh, 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 the velocity of the photon sphere times t minus phi uh, to the minus two nth power. And so that's a very simple singularity and we want to study it. Uh, now, uh, uh, before uh, studying it in more detail, I, I just want to show that uh, this singularity is actually not there in free field theory. And this is a very simple calculation that I won't spend any time on. Uh, we just have a massive scalar field on on a, on a two sphere at finite temperature. Uh, so we have some, uh, a thermal circle and, um, and we just um, uh, uh, forward expand on the, on the thermal circle and, and it's uh, spherical harmonics and we can uh, just compute the two point. With this final answer, um, which involves uh, Legendre polynomials and some, and some, uh, some factors that depend on the time. And 
uh, we can look for uh, uh, divergences in this uh, sum, and they come from large um, spherical L number. And at large L, uh, the uh, Legendre polynomial is sine L times phi. And so uh, we see from the second factor that there are singularities at tau equals uh, plus or minus I times phi. And this is the ordinary light cone once we uh, rotate to uh, Lorentzian time. And so there are no new singularities in free field theory. Um, and uh, we just argue that at infinite coupling, uh, there is a new singularity. And the, uh, uh, the natural thing to assume, uh, the natural um, hypothesis is that uh, the singularity is a artifact of, of infinite coupling uh, uh, because we just show that it's not there in, in free field theory it's probably not going to arise at some finite coupling. So um, that would be the, uh, the, uh, the initial hypothesis. So it, is it clear, before I move on to the, uh, the resolution, is it clear what these singularities are, um, why they arise? Any questions? Is there any question? Please ask. OK. So now let's move on to the main part of the talk. So um, I'll now talk about string theory in the Penrose, uh, the Penrose limit, uh, which is probably familiar to some of you, but I'll, I'll, do a, I'll do a lightning review because it hasn't come up in this field in a while. So, so th uh, the question is, we found new singularities in, in the two-point function. Should we actually trust them, or are they an, an artifact of infinite coupling? Uh, just like the bulk point sing, uh, singularity. Now, it's not clear how we start to address this question because how are we supposed to do string theory in a black hole? Um, um, in the case of the bulk point singularity, the resolution only needed string theory in flat space. Uh, but here we have string theory in a black hole background. It seems insurmountable. Um, luckily, we only need to study this theory very close uh, to the null geodesic because all, because all the physics is, is taking place in the vicinity of of uh, the null geodesic and so we need some way to zoom in on this null geodesic and this, this is called taking the penrose limit so the penrose limit um if i give you a metric and a null geodesic uh, gamma then the penrose limit is is a is a is a metric that's a limit of that metric, and um, it's characterized by a a matrix A A B. And um, here A and B run over uh, d minus two indices. Uh, so in in ADS five, it would be three um, uh, transverse A and B coordinates. Um, and it's the projection, this plane wave uh, matrix AAB is uh, the projection of the Riemann curvature tensor onto a, a, pseudo, a pseudo orthonormal frame for gamma. Uh, so here, X is a vector, it's, it's called the transverse coordinates. U is, is the proper time along gamma, and V is a null direction. And so the only non-flat uh, non part of the metric is, is this part, and it has A, A, B, X, A, X, B, D, U squared. So what does this uh, matrix A, A, B uh, tell us? It tells us what uh, uh, tidal forces do uh, to extended objects uh, uh, near, the uh, near the null geodesic. Um, and and in, in our case, these extended objects are strings. And so it tells us the effect of tidal forces on strings. So um, I'll give the, uh, a couple of very simple examples. So in the case of flat space, ADS space, or, or just, or just uh, the Penrose limit is flat. Uh, so the, uh, the matrix AAB is equal to zero. So that means that there's no tidal force near a null geodesic. 
uh, uh, the second example, which was used um, about uh, 15 years ago, or maybe 20 years ago in this field, is the plane wave limit of ADS CFT, also known as the BMN limit. Um, in this case, one studies ADS five times S5. Um, and you consider an, a null geodesic in S5, and you take it at a point in ADS5. Um, in this case, uh, the matrix A, A, B is constant. Uh, so that's another very uh, simple example. So why is this limit so simple? Uh, so if we look at the, uh, the world line action for point particles, it looks like this. Uh, so it, it has uh, these ordinary flat space parts, and then it has this part. Um, it still looks a bit tricky, but it's much simpler in a, a light cone cage, which is uh, u equals p minus times tau. Here tau is the proper time. Uh, I'm sorry. Here tau is, is the time coordinate on the, uh, on the world line. And um, if we plug that in, we see that the metric or the, uh, the uh, Lagrangian becomes completely uh, uh, quadratic in the, in the transverse modes. And the equations of the motion become x double dot is equal to um, uh, the matrix A uh, times xb. Uh, so it's a, it's a very simple uh, 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 linear equation of motion. And in particular, we see that this is just a collection of harmonic oscillators, and they have some frequency uh, that depends on time. So this is a, a system we can study very simply. Um, it's a fact that for vacuum solutions, uh, uh, the trace of the- Looks like it is kind of a coupled harmonic oscillator, no? Uh, could you say one more time? Yeah, uh, it's like coupled harmonic oscillator. Two oscillators, they are coupled with each other. Yes, exactly. So we, if, the matri if the matrix A is not diagonal, um, yeah. uh, then they're coupled. Um, and uh, actually, it will be diagonal for uh, short shield, but in, in the rotating case, it's not. Um, I won't talk about that too much, but yeah. Um, so one thing that we do know is that the trace vanishes. And so that, that follows from the Einstein, uh, the Einstein equation. And so that means that some of the, uh, some of the eigenvalues are positive and some of them are negative. Uh, now, if we have a positive eigenvalue in this, in this equation, well, that's a... Uh, that's an imaginary uh, frequency harmonic oscillator, and so and, and so that uh, that's an, uh, that's an unstable direction. Good. So that was point particles. Uh, strings are very very uh, uh, similar. All that happens is we have instead of um, uh, three uh, transverse um, um, harmonic oscillators, we have three times infinity um, transverse harmonic oscillators. And, they're, and they're, uh, they're labeled by the mode number N, uh, uh, which labels the string modes. And the equation of motion looks like this. So this is the frequency. Now, um, this is the equation we want to study. And we want to look for some analytically solvable limits. Um, and in general, there are several approximations that, uh, that could work. Um, I should mention that this was, um, this was first analyzed by Horowitz and Steiff in, in uh, 1990. Um, so the, the, uh, the first very simple approximation is if uh, this matrix A is highly, uh, highly uh, localized in a small range of tau. In this case, it'll be like a delta function. Uh, uh, so then the, uh, then the analysis is very similar to strings propagating through a shock wave, uh, where the, uh, the interaction is, is like a delta function. And that was studied by Giddings, Gross, and Majorana in, in 07. And uh, this approximation is, is good at, at, the, at early times, which means very close to um, uh, delta t equals pi and, and delta phi equals pi, 
when the uh, geodesic is very far away from the black hole. Uh, the second approximation is uh, the opposite one, where the frequency is approximately constant. In this case, we, we can apply the adiabatic or WKB approximation, and uh, this will be the case at late times, um, where the photon, uh, sorry, the, the uh, geodesic wraps the photon sphere many times. So uh, before uh, getting to that, I just want to comment that if uh, p minus squared times a is very large and positive, then we see that there are many unstable modes. Uh, because in this equation, we get unstable modes for all n up to, up to p minus times the square root of a, and uh, that's a very large number of modes. And that will be very important for us at late times. Okay, so now let me specialize. Uh, so uh, the Penrose limit of an ADS-5 black hole is, is this. Um, as I said before, it's actually a, a diagonal matrix, and it has one positive eigenvalues and two equal negative, eigen, uh, negative eigenvalues. Now, the positive eigenvalue is, is in the RT5 direction. It's in some combination of that direction. And the, and the, and the negative eigenvalues are along the S3. So those are spherical modes. So uh, to draw it out, um, suppose we start with the circular string. It's just a, a pure circle. And then it, it goes uh, through the geodesic. And it'll be tidally disrupted. Uh, meaning that different parts will be pulled or pushed. So the spherical modes will want to push it in, and the radial modes, um, the positive direction, is going to want to expand it out. And so it'll be disrupted into uh, an elongated shape like this. Okay, any questions on the Penrose limit? Okay, so let's uh, uh, now uh, finally resolve this uh, singularity. So things are going to get a little bit, a little bit technical, but um, please let me know if you have any questions. So I'll start at at at, at the uh, the early time limit, and let me just remind you from before. We have this picture. Uh, uh, the early time limit is near. T equals uh, pi and, and phi equals pi. And we want to study string theory in, in that limit. So ultimately, we're interested in, in the boundary two point function. Um, I'm actually going to compute a, a simpler uh, quantity, uh, uh, which is, the, uh, uh, which is uh, just the bulk to bulk propagator. Um, so this is um, a simpler quantity and it uh, there's some additional complications in the case of the boundary two-point function uh, that I don't want to uh, go into now. And uh, 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 this contains all the, all the necessary physics, so we can uh, discuss it. Um, so you might say that actually uh, this bulk-to-bulk -bulk propagator, it doesn't make sense in string theory because we're used to only computing S matrices in, in string theory. and um, this looks like a, a very off-shell object. In fact, uh, there's this odd fact that uh, the propagator is actually wild invariant. It's it's a good it's a good uh, quantity uh, for uh, for the quantum uh, the quantum gravity on the world sheet, and the reason is because it's the path integral with two d instanton boundary states. We have Dirichlet boundary conditions at 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 the two endpoints, and so we can uh, consider it, and it's a perfectly good uh, quantity uh, to consider. And what it is, is uh, the path integral over all the transverse fields, each of the IS, uh, the action is a function of the, of the transverse fields, and we have some Dirichlet boundary conditions at the endpoints. And um, uh, since the theory is, is quadratic, uh, uh, we just apply a, a one loop approximation. So we have this, uh, the zero mode propagation on field theory uh, problem. There's the uh, fluctuation determinants around that uh, zero mode. And, and that's in the, in the uh, uh, denominator here. 
So here, n is the, n is the mode number, and p minus is the momentum. And uh, we have the product over all the, de all the determinants um, uh, for all three transverse directors. Now, if we're just interested in, in the magnitude of the determinant. Oh, quadratic case, it is OK. But if you have higher order terms, then you can write down some perturbation theory, I think. Yeah, yeah. But um, the, uh, the, simpl uh, the simplifying factor of the, of the Penrose limit is that everything's quadratic. Yeah. Ah, OK. So we, uh, we won't have to do any higher loop calculations, uh, luckily. Um, I think this, comp uh, this computation is actually complicated enough. Um, so if we want a physical interpretation of, of this quantity, of these yes. uh, determinants. Uh, can you explain yeah. a bit more so it would be a little bit? Uh, uh, could you say that again, sorry? I'm saying that, uh, can you physically interpret? Yes, yes, yes. So that's what I'll do now. So, uh, so the magnitude of these uh, determinants is has a has a very simple interpretation. We have some uh, time dependent harmonic oscillators, and what happens if you have a harmonic oscillator with a, a time dependent frequency is that you make particles. Uh, the initial vacuum is not equal to the final vacuum, and uh, in particular, they have some not, uh, uh, some overlap that is not equal to one. And uh, we see that the overlap of the in and the out states is equal, uh, the magnitude of that is equal to one over the de uh, determinant. And so in order to, uh, to study the magnitude of this propagator, we just need to uh, study particle production. So can we call it a kind of a asymmetric type of thing? Time asymmetric. Um, that means that time symmetry is broken. Um, yeah. Um, see, I, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I don't think so because the the matrix A is is um, is invariant under t to the minus t. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think you can have particle production uh, without time asymmetry. Ah. Okay. So uh, particle production is is uh, well studied, especially in this in this one dimensional case. And so uh, we can just compute it. And um, so at in the in the early time limit where the geodesic is very far uh, far away from the black hole, uh, this matrix A is is highly highly localized. Um, it looks like epsilon squared over tau squared plus epsilon, uh, plus epsilon squared, where epsilon is very small. So this looks like a delta function almost. And so what that means is that we can use a sudden, a sudden interaction approximation, a shockwave approximation, uh, where the interaction only occurs at, at the origin. And um, in that uh, limit, the equations of motion for uh, uh, the, unsta uh, the unstable mode, say, x1, uh, the equations of motion are, are that uh, the first derivative uh, gets a uh, discontinuity at the origin. Um, and uh, the other modes, x2 and x3, are, are similar. Um, right. So we just need to study the, uh, uh, this equation of motion. Um, and we want to know the particle reduction in, in this background. So okay. to solve this, yeah, yeah. Continuity you have because of this shock wave. Uh, could you uh, say one, uh, one more time? Please? No, I'm saying that the discontinuity in the solution you have because of this shock wave approximation. Yes, yes, exactly. Hmm. Right. So, um, right. So to solve this equation, we just make a simple ansatz uh, that the uh, the string modes are are freely propagating for tau less than zero, and they're freely propagating for tau, uh, tau greater than zero, and the equations of motion are solved uh, very simply. And uh, uh, using this uh, uh, this equation for b, uh, let's compute uh, the Bogliubov coefficient, and that's equal to 
up on so forth. And then the overlap of the initial and the final state is equal to this equation. So this is the standard formula for the uh, the. So uh, how, how this Bogoliev of coefficients are calculated from the solution? So right. So the the uh, the Bogoliev of coefficient uh, beta is the coefficient of a dagger n. Mm -hmm. So um, and then the uh, the overlap of the n of the n and the out state is proportional to one plus the absolute value of beta squared. Uh, to the minus one n. Okay. okay. Yeah. So uh, this gives us uh, the overlap of the in and the out state, and in particular, it's very very small for large n. So what happens is uh, uh, we shoot this uh, particle in um, on the null geodesic, and a lot of strings are created, and the overlap of the of the final state uh, with the initial state is very small. So actually, that's not quite enough because we only computed the magnitude of the, of the uh, uh, determinant here. Um, in fact, uh, this expression can have a phase. Um, yeah, so uh, to compute this phase, um, we can use this theorem, which is very nice for computing uh, determinants. And this is called the uh, gelfand uh, Jaglom theorem. And this says that if we have a function y, which satisfies y equals zero at the initial point, y prime, I'm sorry, it should be uh, y prime equals one at the initial point. Um, and, and it also satisfies uh, the equation of motion, uh, uh, then we can compute uh, the determinant by uh, just evaluating y at, at the final point. So this is a very simple way to compute determinants without actually uh, multiplying all the eigenvalues together. So in, in our case, we just um, solve for this function y, and we can do that by just uh, plugging in a and a, and a dagger that satisfy uh, the conditions here. And we're left with this final result, which is one minus three pi m i p l over four n r plus the fourth. And it, Indeed, we see that the magnitude of this quantity is equal uh, to this overlap um, here of the, of the initial state with the out state. And, and so that, uh, that matches up. And now, once we have the de uh, determinant, we can just multiply them all together. And we get a simple product of gamma functions. Now we're almost there. So uh, just uh, to back up, uh, to back up a bit, we have this zero mode uh, Green's function, and, and we have all these uh, determinants, and I just computed uh, these uh, determinants as gamma functions. Uh, so that's these guys. Uh, great. So the final thing we need is how the, how the Green's function depends on P minus. Um, it's very simple to see that uh, uh, the zero mode Green's function is it scales like the square root of p minus. And the reason is because near the light cone, the position space Green's function scales like x to the minus three. And, and uh, just uh, translating that gives square root p minus. And we could say that in, in ordinary quantum field theory, uh, the propagator is actually singular on the light cone because the Fourier transform uh, diverges on, on the light cone. Uh, the integral from zero to infinity of square root p minus is infinity. And so that means that the, uh, uh, the propagator is infinity on the light cone. So what happens when we include the stringy modes? Well, these gamma functions can be evaluated using uh, the Stirling approximation. And in fact, uh, the integrand is exponentially suppressed at, at large p minus. So what that means is that this Fourier transform is actually finite on the light cone, and, and the light cone singularity is resolved. So what you said, what approximation? Sterling approximation. Yeah, the Sterling approximation on the, uh, oh, on the gamma. Yes. Yeah. It does that like x to the x, e to the minus x. 
Yeah, so that's like the factorial. Um, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, right. So we see that this is actually resolved. And uh, to give this a physical interpretation, at very large p minus, we're producing many uh, stringy modes on the world on the world sheet. And so uh, the pro uh, the probability that uh, that a particle stays on the light cone is very small. It's it's more likely uh, to uh, turn into strings, and um, and uh, that's why the amplitude is, is uh, suppressed at large p minus. Uh, so, uh, so that's the story at, at, at t equals pi and, and delta phi equals pi, uh, that we thought that there was a singularity, and I just showed it was resolved. Um, but uh, this uh, uh, thing for large p, by assuming Stirling approximation, you can calculate analytically. But without that, can you able to calculate analytically? Without assuming Stirling approximation? You, you mean? Approximate the gamma functions without Stirling. Um, yeah. Uh, well, Stirling is approximation. Not, it's not an assumption, right? It's just a. No, I know that. I'm just saying that uh, is I mean, there it, an it, it, available? That's why. Is, is there a different way of doing it? Um, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, but it is true that Stirling approximation is just not for large value of. P here. Well, uh, Stirling approximation is for large P, yes. Uh, it's basically uh, n factorial. Uh, so if you have large number, then probably it calculates the factorial of that. Probably. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Great. Right. So that's the story. Um, are there any questions about the logic or about the resolution? or about anything else? Uh, one question. Yes. Uh, so can you remind me where is the string length in that formula? Is that uh, the capital L or? Yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, the string length is in, so it's, I set it to one, unfortunately. So it's, it's in, it's in, indeed in, in front of the capital L um, and, and uh, let's see, which way does it go? Um, if the string length is small, then these gamma functions should be equal to one. And so it, it goes in front of P minus. Uh, so there's a, a string length uh, multiplying P minus. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, great. So that, that shows that this singularity is resolved at, at early times. And now it's, it, it would be good to uh, also know about uh, late times. So as I said before, the late time limit is the, is the opposite limit. It's, it's the uh, uh, WKB adiabatic approximation. So the geodesic uh, winds around the photon sphere uh, many times, uh, but the, uh, the basic thing we have to compute is the same thing. It's the, it's the, um, it's, it's the bulk to bulk uh, propagator on, on the light cone, and we're interested in the in the particle production. Now, as I, as I said before, uh, from the uh, the unstable direction, we have a large number of unstable modes at large p minus, and here's their frequency. So, uh, so their frequency is n squared uh, minus uh, p minus squared m over our phot our photon squared, and um, uh, this means that the number of uh, uh, the number of unstable modes it, it grows like p minus because that's the number of solutions uh, uh, to this equation um, uh, that this should be less than zero. And so we have a ton of unstable modes going on, and those are going to lead to the um, uh, uh, the resolution. So uh, 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 we can just use the uh, the uh, the adiabatic approximation here and this is the solution and the number of uh, produced particles is given by the square of that and it's equal to this so all we need to do is is plug in the frequency here and that can easily be done and we find that for n less than the number of unstable modes um, 
but the number of particles produced is very large. It's it, it, it's proportional to our our plus minus our for, our photon to the minus fourth, and and recall that uh, uh, the turning point r plus is very close to the photon sphere at late times. Uh, so this means we make a lot of particles um, in in these modes. Um, and, uh, now to find the o uh, the overlap between uh, the uh, the in and the out state, we just have to multiply all, all these together, and we have basically the same thing um, uh, multiplied up to n and, and unstable. And so this goes like e to the minus some constant times n unstable. And uh, recall that n unstable is, is proportional to p minus, uh, this formula. Uh, doo -doo -doo. And so we see that the overlap is actually exponentially suppressed at, at large p minus, which is exactly what we had before. Uh, you can do a more careful uh, computation and you find uh, this uh, this value uh, for the propagator. And we see again, at large p minus, this is um, exponentially suppressed and the divergence is resolved. Okay, uh, that's the main part of my talk. Um, any questions at this point? Okie doke. So, uh, so now let's, I'll just uh, briefly touch on some um, um, more general cases. So if we have a rotating a pair of black holes, uh, this is like a boundary theory and it's placed at, at finite temperature and also non-zero uh, rotation parameter. So this is a, a more general ensemble. So uh, uh, what are the differences here? Uh, well, if you have a geodesic that's in the, in the equatorial plane, um, meaning the uh, uh, rotation, uh, then you can be ro uh, rotating with the black hole or against it. Um, so you, uh, you can have what's called prograde or retrograde orbits. And uh, something very interesting is that as you approach it, uh, the extremal case, uh, uh, the, prog uh, the prograde uh, photon sphere is actually on the horizon. So that means that these uh, geodesics can get very close to the horizon, and uh, we can actually uh, probe horizon scale physics. So that's a very exciting possibility. Um, in four dimensions, uh, uh, for simplicity, um, you can again compute the, uh, the plane wave uh, matrix, and um, it's, it's the same thing, but uh, with L replaced by L minus AE. Now, uh, something uh, that's interesting for non-equatorial geodesics is that uh, this matrix is, is not uh, diagonal anymore. And so different oscillators mix. Uh, they're no longer de uh, decoupled. And here I just plot the, uh, the singularities. Uh, there's, now an, uh, there's now an asymmetry because uh, we can have geodesics with uh, the rotation or against it. Uh, so that's the reason that I'm on the two sides, um, these um, uh, these blue lines have have, have different slopes. Uh, the different slopes are the are the, are the velocities at the photon sphere. So if you don't uh, like ADS um, and are more interested in flat space, uh, you might you might want to know if uh, these uh, techniques actually work for asymptotically flat black holes. Um, in this case, the propagator is not as well defined in quantum gravity because it's not a, a boundary uh, quantity, but uh, uh, we can uh, still compute it and see what happens. And so uh, we take some large R, R max, and we can uh, we compute the propagator between two points on the sphere at that large radius, and everything is exactly the same um, in the in the Penrose limit, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the one difference is that geodesics uh, geodesi cannot bounce off the boundary because there's no boundary. And so, and so there's just one uh, branch of this uh, singularity as shown here. And again, the singularity is resolved by string theory. Uh, the same approximations work, the shock wave and the adiabatic approximation. And uh, uh, something that's interesting is that 
uh, now this tells a sharp criterion for stringy behavior near, uh, near a black hole. If, if uh, the string length is greater than zero, uh, then th uh, the value of the propagator on, on the light cone is less than infinity. So if you're able to measure the, uh, the, uh, the propagator exactly on, on the light cone, you can tell me if um, alpha prime is zero or not. Of course, that's probably a very uh, hard thing to measure, but um, um, in principle, if you could do it, um, it, it would be it would be very interesting to uh, uh, to know. Okay, so that's about it. I'll I'll, I'll summarize. So we wanted to understand the thermal two point function, um, a very uh, fundamental quantity in 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 uh, conformal field theory. So I first uh, derived some singularities in, in this in this two point function in the holographic uh, setting, and then I showed how they were actually resolved by string theory. So the the um, uh, suggestion here is that uh, the only singularity in in, in a general uh, conformal field theory um, at finite temperature is on the boundary light cone. So what are some interesting extensions? Uh, we only dealt with uh, the two-point function here um, because that's uh, the simplest case. H higher point functions like the four-point function could be interesting because you could have a, uh, a you could have a bulk point singularity, a, uh, a Landau diagram, and also uh, a light cone singularities for the propagators. It could be interesting to, uh, to study uh, charged black holes also. And finally, um, it would be good to apply ADS-CFT the, uh, the other way. Um, uh, could we understand these results uh, from the CFT perspective? Is there any way to understand the singularity uh, uh, resolution in particular um, in, uh, in a simple theory like N equals four uh, yang Mills? Um, so those are some of the things that uh, would be interesting to understand. Um, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'll stop here for questions. Uh, thank you, Matthew, for your detailed and nice talk. And uh, we are happy that you have given your time to give this talk. Now, people can ask questions. Um, and if you have, you, you can directly ask to Matthew. I have one question. This last, you have mentioned about uh, higher point function. So like particularly four point, you know that there is something called conformal bootstrap. So this kind of ideas can be applicable to your setup. And if then what kind of thing you expect to get from that. Right. Yeah, I, I, I know of one paper that uh, studied the bootstrap at finite temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, and they looked at two point function only. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that they saw anything like this, but um, yeah, it would certainly be interesting. Yeah, because I haven't seen any paper with finite temperature. That's why I have asked. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it would be, it'd be kind of pretty interesting. I mean, it, uh, there are, uh, there are uh, many more conf uh, conformal invariants at finite temperature, so uh, the four point function is a lot more complicated. Hmm. Okay. Any other question, guys? Please ask. Uh, so, question. Uh, so, for the singularities, the finite size uh, was important that the boundary uh, CFT is, uh, let's say, on the sphere instead of um, flat space. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, the reason was because at infinite volume, um, it's uh, 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 the only scale is the temperature, and so we can just uh, scale all that out and map to the plane, and then. Well, only this is only true in for two D CFTs, right? Oh no, I, no, it's true for in general. So, it, I mean, it's true that uh, the the only scale is the temperature, but it's not true that the two point function is trivial. You cannot conformally map it to the plane. Well, yeah. So in in higher dimensions, we would just have a a cylinder, which is a, a circle times r to the uh, d, right? Mm -hmm. And a and a cylinder in higher dimensions is 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 conformally mappable uh, to the plane by uh, by uh, uh, radial quantization, right? 
No. Uh, I mean, you mean uh, in radial quantization, you can represent it as a trace, uh, I guess. But it's a uh, sum over four point function. Then. Yeah, this finite temperature bootstrap paper that you were mentioning, that's about um, R D minus one cross S one. And it's about the two point mm -hmm. function. So it's uh, it's not. Oh, oh, am I wrong about it? Um, R D minus one. Uh, oh, 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 oh. oh. Oh, I, ah, uh, um, yeah, I, I could be, I could be wrong. Um, let's see. Oh, 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 sorry. So, right. So, uh, uh, radio quantization would be R times S, S D minus one. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, right. Yeah. It, it could be that there's something there. Yeah, uh, I might not have thought about it hard enough. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. So, Matthew, uh, could you please share this finite temperature bootstrap paper, the link to my email after the talk? Yeah, it would be sure. Good. Yeah. Sure. And uh, any more question, guys? Please ask if you have. Or any general question, if you want to ask to him. And if not, then please unmute yourself and give a clap for Matthew for giving such a nice talk. And uh, we are happy that you gave this talk. And so I know yeah. that this is, this is uh, like uh, all, already 10:30 in the night at Tokyo. So you have managed, uh, it's really great that you have given this talk. It will be posted in YouTube, my channel, okay. and I will share the link with you. And uh, uh, once uh, like you are free a bit, then we will talk about the thing that I have mentioned. Okay, okay. so uh, stay happy, be healthy, and uh, yeah, so hopefully things will be get fine very soon and uh, stay safe okay uh, thank you so much thank you so much bye